So uh, I, I'd like to, to introduce you to, to Paul Sappho, and, and Paul will, will uh, tell you more about John as, as we get things started. I am. Uh, but Paul is a, a member of our board. Uh, he is a, a futurist, a prognosticator, and... Uh, You're cutting into our time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, on, and with that note, Paul Sappho, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And John is a promising young tech writer here in Silicon <laughs> Valley uh, who's just done a, a new book that we think is going to do pretty well. Um, I truly think that John does not need an introduction, um, though I promised to bring up a couple of embarrassing details about him during the conversation. Um, I thought we'd start with a question to the audience okay. and then hand it to you to get things. Yeah. So just a quick show of hands, and we'll ask this question again at the end as a test of John's powers of persuasion. Um, raise your hand if you think we're going to be overwhelmed by our robot overlords in some reasonable period in the future, that we're all doomed, AIs are going to take over. Show of hands. Jameis, two, three, okay. About five. And who thinks that robots will just become loving, unobtrusive companions in our lives? <laughs> About eight, and, uh, and okay, and we'll get to the rest of you soon. So, okay, John, why? Um, I could. Uh, I, would you like a first question or? Yeah, first question, or I can just. So uh, this book's been a while in the making, and as I recall, it goes back to what, 2004. Well, so what what Paul is saying is that. We had this tradition of taking field trips. We've had it for a long time. We've gone off and done various things. We've landed on aircraft carriers. Uh, we've gone to various Air Force and other facilities. We're still trying to get into Area 51, if anybody has any contacts. And in 2004, we went to the first uh, uh, DARPA uh, Grand Challenge. It was the Aut Autonomous Vehicle Grand Challenge, which was held in the desert. And uh, we, we had just an absolute great time. Um, I, I think Paul got amazing pictures of the robots running amok, and, and it was it was, uh, it was really a, a statement. You know, this, this contest had been uh, put together by the then director of DARPA, a man by the name of Tony Tether, because he wanted, uh, uh, Congress had set this goal for a third of the ground fleet of our mi military vehicles of being autonomous or teleoperated by 2015. Uh, here we are in 2015, you'll notice that that's not true. It, it is true in air vehicles, but it's not true in land vehicles, which is, I think, interesting. But he wanted to jumpstart things, and so he thought he'd you know, get away from the military contracting world and he'd turn it loose to the hackers and the universities and the corporations. And uh, the first event was an absolute disaster. Um, I think there were 13 competitors. I think the best- 24 competitors. No, not the first, not the first, first one. First one? Really? Yeah, 24. There are 24. They all ended up dead in the desert. The best, uh, the best vehicle was a Carnegie Mellon uh, car, uh, uh, put together, a uh, team put together by Red Whitaker, and it made it for seven miles. But Paul got these great pictures, which I didn't bring. It's too bad. Of it was, it was missing the road for miles before it, it actually drove through a fence road. on its way out. Yeah, on both sides of the roads, it, yes. missed, it missed the road. And uh, uh, there was a wonderful uh, uh, motorcycle that was gyroscopically stabilized that entered, and uh, the the kid who designed it, Andrew Lewandowski forgot to turn on the gyro stabilizer at the beginning and it went like that. And, and, and Paul got us a ride in this airplane afterwards and the colorful robots were spread out over the desert. And I just fell in love with uh, this as a sort of a new area of reporting. Um, I had uh, for uh, decades literally been covering cybersecurity. And even in 2004, it was just getting more and more tedious, and I began to feel like if I wrote one more story about a testosterone-poisoned teenager with an, an, an attitude, I was going to have an aneurysm, and I needed to do something else. And robots and AI uh, were fun. And uh, so I did a, a lot of reporting over the next 10 years. And at a certain point, I, I realized that um, this book is, is not a sequel to my previous book, which was about stuff that happened right around Stanford between 1965 and 1975, and it was a prehistory of personal computing. But there was a point of connection, and the point of connection was that in the last book, I noticed that it, right at the dawn of interactive computing, there were these two laboratories that were started roughly at the same time on either side of Stanford campus, equidistant from the campus. One was created by a man by the name of John McCarthy, who had coined the term artificial intelligence in the 1950s and then came from MIT in the 1960s and he established a Stanford AI lab. And at that point, in the original proposal to DARPA, 
he said it would take a, a decade to build a thinking machine. That was the, the time horizon they had to replace a human. And on the other side of campus, of course, there was the Augmentation Research Center, which was started uh, by Doug Engelbart. Engelbart, of course, had, had uh, invented, uh, would invent the, the computer mouse and hypertext. And Engelbart had this idea that you could use these, te these technologies to augment human intelligence. And I realized that these were two contradictory philosophies. And in fact, if you looked at what happened in the intervening period, they created two communities. One was the AI community that, that continued to sort of try to replace all of the sort of attributes that we have. And the other sort of coalesced around this field called human-computer interaction, HCI. And in that field, they put the human at the center of the design process. And I saw that it was not just a dichotomy, but it was a paradox, of course, because if you augment the human, in practice, you need fewer humans. And so I set out to try to square that circle. Uh, and uh, the book is sort of an exercise in looking at a series of people who have chosen to cross over or not. Um, a, a lot of people uh, were, you know, the classic example is Terry Winograd, who uh, was a pioneering AI researcher. As a graduate student, he wrote this program called Shridlu, um, which was a, a natural language understanding program in which you could uh, basically I interact with a software program to move blocks in a virtual universe. And he spent the next 10 years uh, basically in, engaged in trying to, to sort of pursue the field of artificial intelligence. And then sort of famously in the, in the early 1980s, he gave up and he walked away and he became uh, a researcher in the field of human computer interaction. And to my mind, this was this incredibly important arc because uh, Terry had this really seminal influence in the world. It was Terry Winograd as the advisor to Larry Page who convinced Larry Page um, that he should work on the page rank algorithm. He should work on search rather than working on self-driving cars. So that was something that sort of changed the world in a really interesting way. And I looked at... Sort of like that scene in The Graduate. Plastics. <laughs> Plastics. <laughs> Today I would say metamaterials. Metamaterials. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you heard it here tonight. That's another story. Yes. Um, so, I, you know, I, I looked at probably a, a dozen or more people who had made decisions one way or the other. Uh, and, you know, at the, at, at the, at the sort of the very... Uh, basis of my perspective on what's going on in Silicon Valley and the world is, uh, you know, I, I, I think the field is called the social construction of technology. I believe that, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is um, Churchill and then um, more recently, who, uh, um, Churchill and who's the... Uh, the, the you mean Lady Astor? Uh, we shape our buildings and then they shape us. Uh, this oh, is, uh, McLuhan. McLuhan. First we... Yeah. In Yes, we, yeah. make, we create our technologies yeah. and we turn around and our technologies. These are basically out. tools that we shape, and uh, that was what interested me. And so that's, that's where, 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 where I got started and sort of where I finished as well. So, you know, let's head off into the future a second, but go back a little bit to the history, because I think the place in your book where you talk about how John McCarthy came up with the name AI, which was probably, I'm sure most people in this room don't know the story. It was just one of these wonderful cases of academic kind of... <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So this, I think this has been lost in history, but I sort of I, I was very intrigued by Norbert Wiener, and you know Wiener uh, basically at the very dawn of computing he created this this term cybernetics, um, which was the, the study of communication and control in the human and the and the animal, and uh, he wrote this book Cybernetics in '48 about the same time that the the computer was invented, and then three years later he was kind of aghast by what might happen. He wrote a second book called The Human Use of Human Beings. And Wiener was a, an interesting character on so many levels. I mean, he sort of defined the term absent-minded professor. Um, one of the things I discovered, which I think is actually sort of academic scholarship, I haven't been able to find it anywhere else, is where did the term artificial intelligence come from? And I was reading in John McCarthy's archive, and of course, the term artificial intelligence was coined by John McCarthy ahead of the 1956 Dartmouth Summer Study Group on AI. Uh, and McCarthy is very direct. He created the term artificial intelligence because, one, he didn't like the term cybernetics. He thought that uh, it was far too analog, which is very interesting in, in, in terms of where we are now and the importance of analog things and the, the rise of robotics. And he particularly didn't like Wiener. He thought Wiener was a boor and bombastic and he wanted nothing to do with him. And so he coined a term to define this new field, uh, which is artificial intelligence. Of course, 
cybernetics, uh, in part because I think of Wiener's politics, was sort of driven to the side. And it, you know, it's a field in, in Europe, not so much in America today. Well, McCarthy really rejected the defense community, where Wiener was sort of playing. No, no, it was Wiener who defense it. That's right. right. Versa. McCarthy no, was, I mean, he took defense money all the way. I don't think he was a big fan of the military, but he was. Happy to take their money. I mean, Mac McCarthy started as a communist, but that's an entirely other story, uh, which we probably, that's, that's the last book we don't need to go, go down that yes. path. And then famously turned and became a conservative at the end of, end of his life. But, uh, as Samuel Johnson once observed, nothing resembles a hollow so much as a swelling. <laughs> Yeah, so. That was, so, you know, it was, it was sort of setting out those two communities and trying to understand how they interact and uh, sort of using this as a model for sort of making the argument that human design matters going forward and that, um, you know, we are at the end uh, designing uh, these systems. I was at this really remarkable conference in 2013. Uh, there is a conference every year on humanoid robots. And uh, a roboticist by the name of Ron Arkin, uh, who's also an ethicist, uh, gave uh, a talk at this conference, which was basically a 200 leading roboticists in, in the world. Basically, the talk was titled, um, How Not to Create a Terminator. And he had, uh, this was in the midst of the DARPA Robotics Challenge, which of course was the follow-on conference to the Autonomous Vehicle Challenge. And in this case, uh, a DARPA program manager had, had created this idea that you would, uh, you would build a machine that could work in a Fukushima-like environment where humans couldn't work. And um, uh, there, were, uh, there were two contests, unlike the, the DARPA autonomous vehicle uh, contest. And this was, this was before the first contest that he gave this talk. And he sort of put up a series of videos. And he basically showed all the examples. There were sort of eight tasks that you had to perform in this uh, DARPA contest. You had to drive a vehicle. You had to walk. You had to open a door and pass through it. You had to close a valve. You had to walk over uneven ground, uh, throw a switch, and climb a ladder. And, uh, and he basically <laughs> put up the videos of all the sort of Terminator-like uh, you know, things. And it came up with the best defense against the Terminator. Which, which is? The oh, no, no, you mean that, that's at the very end. Of, yes. Well, so that's jumping ahead. Um, uh, Sorry. So, so. <laughs> You know, we just we had the, the first and then the second of these contests. The second one was held this uh, this summer in uh, in Los Angeles, and it was really remarkable. And to me, it clearer than anything else is ground truth of where we are in terms of robotics in an unstructured world. We had 24 teams um, who were given millions of dollars in funding in several years to build robots to sort of pursue these goals, and three of the robots were able to actually accomplish the task. Um, but most of them couldn't. In fact, most of them couldn't open the door. And so um, Gil Pratt's son, as a college student, turned to, to Rod Brooks and said, you know, if you're worried about the Terminator, just keep your door closed. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, that's, there's, there's, there's more truth to that, uh, because when you start to sort of, uh, uh, then you, you would think, because if you drill down into the field reports of those teams, they're, you know, they're, here are the best roboticists in the world, given millions of dollars to basically design robots that are supposed to be de able to do things in unstructured environments. And they were almost entirely teleoperated. There was very, very little autonomy in, used by any of the teams. And DARPA made it hard because they'd, they'd sort of scramble things every once in a while. And so the teams basically, the machines couldn't, couldn't operate. They had some very low level walking behavior. Um, and. Um, you know, I mean, actually, so should we, should sure. we show some slides um, or show, show some videos? So um, let me. Where's just in case we need technical no, no, help, Michael? This, stand I, by. I think this will work. So this is this is Boston Dynamics, which is a um, which is a. Um, let's see if I can get and it. Tap it a second time. Yeah. Oops. There we go. Oh, oops. Nope. Sorry. How about that? And uh, now I have to tap it a second time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there a robot in the house? Okay, okay. Hands off. There we go. So this is a machine that's designed by a company that was started by Mark Rayburn, arguably the best designer of walking machines in the world. Boston Dynamics, of course, was acquired uh, by Andy Rubin when he was building a, 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 a robot division for Google uh, two years ago. And um, this is an evolved version that was actually sort of uh, a machine that was originally designed uh, for the Pentagon. That's now illegal in Massachusetts. And, 
<laughs> and then it's been refined for Google. And when, when Andy was going around the country, um, his vision and buying, he, he acquired about 13 companies, and his vision was the Google delivery vehicle would show up at your door and the Google robot would hop off the back and run the package up to your, up to your, uh, to your mailbox. And um, so, but what you don't see there is the guy with the backpack and the wireless uh, controller. See, these, these machines look autonomous, and there is a, a lower level of autonomy. I mean, the fact that it can climb those stairs like that is incredibly uh, impressive. But Though, incidentally, it was breaking news. You probably didn't even see it today. I there didn't. was um, proof that low levels of autonomy plus teleoperation can be very profitable. Um, somebody in Nogales had 23 pounds of pot drop into their backyard that fell off a Mexican drug drone, bringing it into the U.S. A drone? Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't miss that. But okay, so this is a highly choreographed Boston Dynamics video, but here, here are the outtakes from this DARPA robotics challenge that I was telling you about. <laughs> oh! This is supposed to be a robot that can't fall over. The designers of that robot didn't know they had to go through sand. Don't laugh at your overlords. <laughs> so that's where we are today. Uh, just for, for 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 context. So um, that brings up a question that I thought would come up later, but I think now is a really good time. Parts of this, well, way back in the '60s, as you note in your book. Hubert Dreyfus, his famous rejoinder to the enthusiasts was that progress in this field was like, you know, climbing a tree and saying, I'm pretty well on my way to the moon. Yeah. Parts of this feel exponential. So the arc of the robotic grand challenge out in the desert went from, you know, robots failing spectacularly in 2004 to robots in 2007 robotic cars demonstrating that they understood the California Vehicle Code better than 98% of Californians. And that looks pretty exponential, you know, but... I've become a skeptic on exponentials. I so this is it. To, so so yeah. how, how is well, this... So I actually think progress in this field has been really episodic. And in fact, um, uh, AI, over a long period of time, perhaps more than any other field I know, has over-promised and under-delivered. Um, you know, going back to... Uh, McCarthy's original uh, sort of prognosis of a decade. Um, even before well, that... Well, he just didn't mention which decade. Uh, yeah, that's right. In, in, in 58, when the first neural net was, it was demonstrated, uh, the New York Times article that appeared to report about it said that they would have thinking machines in a year. Um, there was the AI winter when a whole series of companies started in Silicon Valley, which Paul knows about uh, intimately because he was general counsel for one of them, Technology. Uh, they, you know, there was a, there was a great washout. Now, what, what's happened is that we've reached a period because of the success of the variety of machine learning technologies where we made very rapid progress in perception. No, no, dis, no disputing it. Machines are starting to see and machines are starting to listen. Uh, cognition, not so much. Uh, the, so far, the various machine learning technologies have, have not made great strides in the, the kinds of things you have to do in an unstructured environment. And, uh, you know, they may make that progress, but when people say exponentials, um, you have, uh, you know, you have this notion of the singularity, for example, which, of course, was originally proposed by John von Neumann and then sort of, sort of popularized by Werner Vinge, the computer science and science fiction uh, uh, author. And 
So by their uh, measurement, we're supposed to be at intelligent machines by what's the current number? 2023, 2027? It's uh, singularity it's really is the point at which 3, machine intelligence is supposed to surpass human intelligence. And so, you know, my my forecast, by the way, when we finally have machines that pass the Turing test, the real discovery will be that most humans can't pass the Turing, the Turing test. test. <laughs> yeah, the Turing test is its its, its own separate is discussion. Separate. But you have people like Jeff Hawken and, and, and Ray Kurzweil in Silicon Valley who basically believe that we understand human biological cognition. They're sort of, I would argue they're reductionists, but they, their argument is we understand the fundamental algorithms that, have, that you know, go, go on in the cortex, and we simply need to scale it up. And you know, I, when you talk to the neuroscientists in the world, you just, that's just not what the neuroscientists community, neuroscience community believes. And then couple that with the fact that the, basically the wheels are falling off Moore's law right now. So that notion of you know, what we're seeing is an S-curve. We're seeing the really interesting part of an S-curve and the, the attributes of Moore's law that have sort of, you know, the Silicon Valley's belief structure has been built out, they're no longer holding true. Denard scaling, or that is the increase in clock speed stopped a decade ago. More importantly, over the last two or three years, you know, machines were supposed to get faster, not just faster, they're supposed to get faster, faster. So, uh, clock speed's flattened out, that's not true. They're also supposed to get cheaper faster. And that's been the driving force in Silicon Valley over a long, long period, except over the last year or two, the cost of transistors for the vast bulk of the industry has stopped falling. So if those two things are gone, then that wonderful exponential goodness that we've gotten the free ride on for Silicon Valley for decades is, is over. And so you know, you're down to creative breakthroughs from human beings to get us farther, and that may happen. I, you know, I, they, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on now. In By the way, there's a nice article about this in the New York Times yesterday. A couple of days ago, yeah. A couple of days ago, yeah. um, which I recommend reading because it's also mentioned in the book, is that Gordon Moore and his conceiving of Moore's Law was hugely original, but he was sitting in the audience back in the 1950s when? Well, so, uh, you know, the very first moment of sort of understanding the, the, the idea that would become Moore's Law is this notion that uh, Doug Engelbart first proposed at the very first um, International Solid State Circuit Conference in Philadelphia in 1960. He had worked, interestingly, in uh, NASA, uh, NASA uh, Ames um, uh, wind tunnel. And he discovered that the aeronautical engineers uh, had this notion or this tool called similitude. And they would build a small model and scale it up. And so when photolithography came along in 1959, 1960, he realized, obviously, that you would, could also scale things down. And he gave this talk in, in, in 19, 1960, and, and Moore was in the audience. And five years later, in electronics, he codified it. Uh, and it became uh, called Moore's Law thereafter. And it's held true you know, that you get this doubling of transistor density at regular intervals. Of course, the intervals have changed over the time. It's not a law of physics. It's about an ecosystem, and it's, this, it's, it's been this very effective signaling mechanism that's kept this industry going. And it, the other thing that's happened uh, is that you know, Intel just missed. Intel famously for decades uh, was on this TikTok uh, uh, design process. One year they'd shrink the technology, the next year they'd create a new design. And they, for the first time in two decades, missed this uh, just a couple of months ago. It's now TikTok talk. And so it's gone from two years to two and a half or three years, even for the best uh, manufacturer in the world. So I'm not gonna, I, we're gonna come back to this because I'm not gonna let you off the hook in terms of predicting how soon the robots actually arrive. And, and also similarly, how soon we will actually get augmentation tools beyond spreadsheets and yeah. word processors. But the other thing it seems like has been very consistent is public fascination with this. So I, I, I brought a copy of uh, Ruhr, Rossum's Universal Robots, 1923, which is, this is the play that gave us the name robot, and public fascination in the 20s with robots doing wonderful things was really high, and then we get to the early 30s, and one of my favorite magazines that lasted, one issue, The Technocrat, and it's a little hard to see, we'll put this up on the page, a big robot throwing people over the top of the Capitol. I, I'm hoping those, that's members of Congress. Um, so it seems like, so we're about every 10, 15 years, we have this funny cycle of, we, we go from ignoring robots to being thrilled by robots, to being terrified by robots, to ignoring robots. And right now well, we're in the midst of this robot fascination. Well, it's also, it's also technological anxiety. I mean, there've been a series of books 
that all uh, sort of play on the notion that we're going to have a tremendous disruption to the workforce uh, over the next decade or two decades as a result of, of uh, progress in AI. And I started in that camp. I mean, as a matter of fact, I was part of the problem. I, I think in probably 2010, I began seeing that this pattern recognition technology that was beginning to work was starting to sort of creep its way up the white collar workforce. And for the first time, you were getting $35 an hour paralegals and $400 an hour attorneys who were being displaced by e-discovery software that could do a demonstrably better job of reading documents than humans could. You could actually see of course, it having an that's impact. That's the really insulting part is you get a law degree, you get all that hard work, and you're not even replaced by an artificial intelligence. You're replaced by a piece of form software. <laughs> Very true. But but you know what what what's happened is there's did, you know this is this has happened at regular intervals in, in our society. I mean sort of um, sadly, Jeremy Rifkin, this economist, wrote a book in 1995 called The End of Work, and in the ensuing decade, the, uh, the, the, uh, the workforce grew more robustly than it had for the previous two decades. So it's very, you have to pick your spots and be careful. But you've got to give Jeremy economy. credit. I mean, Jeremy has made a career of hitting a large nail not quite on the head, but he usually tries to hit the nail about 15 or 20 years ahead of everyone else. Well, he's, he's taking victory laps now, from what I've heard, that he's saying that, you know, this time for sure, Rocky and Bullwinkle. No, that's right. That, <laughs> that trick never works. No, I, I've really, uh, actually, even more than when I, you know, the, you, you finish a book and then a year goes by before it's published. And I've come, you know, I, I raised a lot of questions that sort of set me apart from people like Andrew McAfee and, and Eric Brindelson, Martin Ford, Jerry, uh, Jerry Kaplan, who've all sort of worried that this wave of technology is going to destroy jobs on Moss. And I was in that camp. And you know, actually, what, what, there was one conversation that really moved me away from that. And, and it was with Danny Kahneman. And I was sort of uh, at, at dinner with him. And my hair was on fire about the impact of robotics and manufacturing in China. And he said, you don't get it. In China, the robots are going to come just in time. And I said, excuse me? And he pointed out to me that China is a society that is aging much more dra dramatically than ours. They don't have immigration. Yep. They have a one-child policy. Two, 2017 is the key year. What happens? In is that's when the flip starts with the Chinese population, and by 2026. And of course, the Japanese uh, society is actually imploding. They're going to lose a third of their population. It's true in Korea. It's true in Europe. Not so much in the U.S., ironically, because we have immigration, which is really quite Yeah, the United ironic. States has been said it will a, be the Dorian A little gray. less, but even we're an aging economy. And the point is that you know, the dependency ratio is, is going to increase all over the advanced world. And that's going to change the dynamic. You can't take a snapshot. You have to look at this as, as, as something that's dynamic. Plus, because we're going to have this dependent population, you might actually need elder care robots at some point in the future. So. You mentioned the Japanese, and they've had a very special relationship with robots that I think is unequaled by any other population. Um, a love affair. Even. A love affair. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, we won't go there. Um, what about the scenario that we all desperately want the robots and they don't arrive? Well, so okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm making these bets. I, they're not, they're not so long bets, but they're kind of long bets. Well, we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, you know. For me, a, a benchmark would be um, a robot that could care for an elder who needed to take a shower. Um, that's a really challenging thing. And the Euro Europeans have, have basically put down a billion euros on a project to do just that. And it's not clear that we're going to get there uh, within my lifetime. Uh, um, you know, the, the other sort of classic one. Um, you know, thank God nerds in Silicon Valley learned to start showering about 15 years ago. So uh, this was the second uh, autonomous vehicle grand challenge, and that's Sebastian Thrun. Uh, and the car had just driven off the road into a giant bush, which is ap actually the, the best possible outcome for a reporter, is a robot crashes and you can walk away from the crash. It, it gives you a lead. But um, you know, what most people don't really, I mean, I was not at Google's announcement t today. They had a, another uh, a sort of press event about their self-driving car um, project. and. Um, they, they did the same thing about six months ago. And what people don't realize is Google sort of split their car program. And they created a, a second car program around vehicles that go uh, no faster than 25 miles an hour and are heavily wrapped in foam in case they hit something uh, with plastic windshields. Um, and, and they're they, loose all over they, Mountain View. And, and San Antonio, I think, where else? Uh, San Antonio? Or Shopping Center, yeah, uh, no, they're Castro Street and Mountain Antonio. View. 
It's somewhere in Texas. It's getting so bad, I was caught in a robot traffic jam <laughs> on my way to Singularity University about uh, two weeks ago. But, but I've been going around saying, look it, I live in San Francisco. If you can send a Google car or a Tesla car to me uh, and pick me up and take me to dinner in Palo Alto in 1925, uh, 2025, I'm buying dinner, so 10 years from now. Um, I think there are just too many edge cases and the liability issues are too strong. We're going we're gonna to have cars with lots of intelligence in them, but I don't believe we're going to have you know, free-range, self-driving cars. And by the way, the when, when that robot's available to take you to dinner, here's my forecast, is there will, you know, most of us won't own robotic cars. We all know that story. But there will be the 1% of the 1% who will have to have their robotic cars, you know, like the Mercedes concept car that looks like a moving blob of mercury. And what they will do is they will solve the San Francisco parking problem as follows. They will have the car drop them off, and rather than pay for parking for their robotic car, they'll have their robot car cruise around San Francisco. So we're going to have a street full of empty robotic cars, yeah. keeping themselves occupied while their, their owners yeah. have dinner at Dominique Krenz. Well, look, at so what Google discovered is, you know, they started out with professional drivers who watched over the cars, and they, were, they did them spectacularly well. I think there are 1.2 million miles without a, com without a computer-caused accident. But at a certain point, at the beginning of this year, they began to give their cars to their employees to commute with. And they instrumented the cars and watched them. And what they discovered is that the, at the end of a long day, their employees got, to, got distracted up to and including falling asleep. And this is what's called the handoff problem. If you're asleep or you're playing World of Warcraft and the car gives up on a particular edge case incident and says, here, you take control. That's called, that's called the handoff pro problem, and it's, you, know, you have to be in situational awareness within a quarter of a second. It's just not going to happen. It's just, and so it's very interesting that Toyota, about three weeks ago, gave $25 million to the Stanford AI lab and the MIT AI lab not to work on self-driving cars, but to work on what they call intelligence cars. And this is basically an AI versus IA dichotomy. They've decided that they're going to work on a generation of cars that will keep you in the loop but we'll put a, a sort of a genie or a guardian angel or a driver ed teacher over your shoulder. And so when you do something dumb, the car will step in and correct your error. And I think that's a much more solvable problem than the, the notion of putting freight liners on the freeway sure. well, you know, without humans. In them. Apropos, you know, Bill Gibson, the future's already arrived. It's not evenly distributed yet. That's not a future scenario. We all trust our lives to robots in transport today. Anybody who flies in a commercial jet, a, a, yeah. a 340 or a 777 flying at altitude is not being flown by a human. A human being cannot fly that plane to optimize speed, angle of attack. And there's something called the coffin corner. Um, you, you know what the coffin corner is? It's the speed for an airplane above which the plane starts to fly apart and below which the plane starts to fall and crash. And for the U-2, at its altitude, the coffin corner is about five knots between stall and breakup. Well, it turns out the A340 is about 20 knots. And if you want a case in point of the handoff problem, it was Air France 447 in 2008, which in less than uh, nine minutes went from routine normal flight to hitting the ocean. The pilots figured it out what was wrong, but they figured it out 30 seconds too late because the software on that plane did a lousy handoff. So it's a, de it's a design issue in some ways. But you know, back, back so, a little bit more on the employment. Uh, we'll hold that. Okay. But I want to ask you a question in the book. What was the, I, I think I know the moment, but the, when was the moment that was the scariest moment in researching this book? Was it on the road to the Dead Sea? Uh, actually, no, the, the Dead Sea was a little freaky. I, uh, there's a, an Israeli company that supplies camera technology that, uh, to most of the sort of tier one uh, 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 automobile manufacturers, and they want to get into the self-driving cars world themselves. Uh, they have a particular design that the, the, the camera gets its structure of the world from motion because it's, it's monocular, it's not stereoscopic, and so the car, when it starts up, goes back and forth like this, which is a little, a, a little disconcerting. I, actually, that was, the, that was the most interesting moment. Do you have a video of one of these? Uh, I do, I do. No, no not on, no, no, okay. not, not, not with me. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, um, we should, um, 
I'm going to invite questions from the audience. Uh, and, and here's how it works. If you have a question, ask it as a question. If you have a comment, don't waste your time trying to make it a question. Um, <laughs> but either way, try and make it brief and pointed so that John can you know, give an answer and we can get in a bunch. And I'll filter him in here as we go. And just sort of, you know, one more point on the manufacturing or the, the robotics thing. This one's fun because this is another one of the companies that was bought by, uh, bought by, uh, by Google. Uh, this is a company in Palo, in Palo Alto called Industrial Perception. Which I know if I hit the button one more time, it's not. <laughs> Loading and unloading uh, unstructured boxes from a back of truck. <laughs> that was your new iPad. And what, what was interesting about that is that was made possible by the Xbox, basically. There was a sensor, a structured light sensor that was allowed, uh, designed to allow you to do interesting things in your living room. And that pushed the cost of machine vision technology down dramatically by an order of magnitude. And it began to show up in interesting applications like this. So the deal was, when they were, before they were bought by Google and they were trying to negotiate with the United Parcel Service, uh, a human moves about one box every six seconds. They weigh up to 70 pounds, they get tired, their backs get hurt. Um, they would get the contract at four seconds and they were at four seconds when they were acquired by Google and they thought they could go to two seconds. And you know, there aren't that many people, it turns out, in the world. Uh, the workforce, uh, the, the labor force of people who do that now is about 70,000 people. So there aren't that many jobs, but you know that's one of those things. It is is the world a worse place if that job goes away? Um, as as long as they're retrained. Say a word about Amazon. Well, so well we have, so Amazon has gone down this path with a technology that they bought from a company called Kiva. There there are two types of of sort of uh, retrieval of of products inside warehouses. One's called case pick, where they move cases of of goods around. The other is called piece pick, where they move the individual. Uh, and in the, in the old warehouses, in the Amazon situation, the workers would run around the, the, um, the warehouses and they would grab things and then bring them back and put it in a box. They bought a company called Kiva and the, the notion that Kiva has pursued in terms of automation is they realized the things they couldn't replace are dexterity and vision. And so in the Kiva model of the world, the human sits in one place and the robots bring the right product to the right place at the right time. And of course, uh, 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 Amazon is working very hard on sort of taking the humans out of, out of the loop. And the, the, the joke is, uh, when the robots finally come to the Amazon warehouse, they'll have to have air conditioning because you know, they won't work without the air conditioning. Uh, but they're not there yet uh, that, uh, because those turn out to be hard problems. They sponsored a contest uh, uh, this year at a technical, a technical conference in Seattle. And it's clear that picking individual products out of bins is still not a solved problem um, for dexterity and for object recognition reasons. So. Well, it's not a bad thing. A, a mutual friend of ours got seven free computers from Amazon because they shipped her the wrong <laughs> package and they had no process for returning them. Was it a computer them. error or a human error? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, good question. Either way, they wouldn't take them back. So, question. Oh, Brian. Um, John, I'm curious. I, I heard. Uh, I attended an effective altruism conference, and Elon Musk was talking about the challenge that he was putting out to create safeguards uh, around artificial intelligence. I'm curious what you make of yeah. that. Wait, so, Ryan, I have, I have the horrible task of having to repeat your question for everyone. So give me the haiku version, then I will repeat it. What do you think of Elon Musk's uh, challenge around protections around artificial intelligence. Okay, so what do you think of Elon Musk's challenge around protections yeah, so on artificial uh, intelligence? Elon has famously said that we're in danger of summoning the demon. Um, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking has, has said similar things. Bill Gates has worried about uh, AI uh, uh, independent intelligence. And, uh, you know, I guess I, I th one is, I think that they've performed a really important service, but not because I think the machines are going to crawl out of the test tube any anytime soon. Uh, I think... Certainly um, not out of Microsoft. I don't think there's any, there's any evidence that we're close to sentient machines. Uh, however, increasingly, we, machines are making autonomous decisions, uh, from weapons to the workplace. And I think the discussion about autonomy in machines is an important one to have. And they've, 
in the, uh, it's, what's it called, the, the Foundation of Life. They set up an organization, I'm blanking on the name right now, and it's raising all the right questions. Um, uh, we're on the brink of building uh, machines that make killing decisions, and I think we should have a discussion about that before we go down that path. Um, the United States is in the process of, of deploying what they call a semi-autonomous cruise missile right now. There's a debate about how semi and how autonomous it actually is. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we're on the cusp of a, a, a really significant arms race. And before we enter into that arms race, we, we, we might raise some of these and questions. I don't think it's in your book, but you should tell the story about what happened in South Africa with the autonomous gun. Oh, this is way back in the 90s. Yeah. They were proudly showing off, I won't mention the company name because it could be interesting, a autonomous high-powered gun. And they had lots of um, uh, dignitaries there to watch it, and the gun uh, went off wrong and like, <laughs> took out all the dignitaries. <laughs> it really sucks when you have to well, kill your customers. No, but there, there is an argument that's being made that uh, autonomous weapons won't c create war crimes, um, that you will actually be able to kill who you want to kill. And uh, I actually don't subscribe to that argument, but that is, that is the nature of the debate. Question here. Yeah. Um, stand uh, up and project. Uh, hi, Carlos. Do you think that uh, IA will make somehow less relevant the dichotomy that you mentioned in the beginning of your talk? I, well, I, so I, in the book, I, I try to, to I, there are a number of examples of, of sort of people who've crossed over and basically using AI technologies for IA, uh, uh, for IA design. And the classic one to my mind, Oh, I'm sorry. AI is artificial intelligence, and Doug Engelbart coined the term intelligence augmentation, IA. Um, and, and so um, if you look at a, a, a service like Siri, um, Siri is a classic example of, of machines acting as partners to humans. And I think that's sort of the, the best case of, of where that design might go, and it's touching you know, the lives of hundreds of millions of people right now. Google search, the same thing. It's an IA example. So, I, you know, I'm actually hopeful, um, you know, and I think it's a, it's a design question. The humans make these decisions, and sometimes they're made just for cost reasons, and sometimes we should automate things, but we should think about it consciously of what we automate and what we don't automate, and, you know, there, there, you know, there are, there's a set of human values that should be in place in the design process. So I realize we've really given IA short shrift in this conversation, and, of course, the title of your book refers to a poem that so brilliantly summarizes IA. Do you want to read go, go, the page? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this say. is uh, Richard Brodigan's poem um, and the relevant passage at the very end. of a, I like to think of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors, joined back to nature, returned to our mammals, brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. Describe the AI, I mean, we all kind of know what the artificial intelligence world would be like if it really arrived. What's the IA world look like well, if it actually arrives? You know, I'm so religious about, you know, what, the great thing about being a reporter is you just have to jot down what the visionaries say. You don't actually have to, like, stake out the ground. Right. This is also <laughs> the, I'm not real good at pool, but I like to play for money. <laughs> You know, I've been having this, let me, let me treat it seriously, because I've been having this debate within my family. My, my wife is caring for her 94-year-old father with Parkinson's right now. And, you know, the, the, the sort of the vision that I have is if you could, I mean, and you know, the, when you actually have to do the care for your parent, it really sort of sharpens a lot of issues for you. And um, <coughs> the question is, I mean, so the, the hope is that these machines could allow people who become dependent and go into assisted living facilities to stay independent and have a community longer. And I can actually see that design. I could also see a design that became very dark and very bleak. There's a, a new book that's also come out by Sherry Turkel, who sort of argues that we're plunging into a world where we're isolated from one another and in conversation with machines. And that's sort of the dark vision that's implicit in that. And I don't think it has to be that way, although I could see it going in that direction. That was, of course, so brilliantly done. A whole Earth review, I think it was the Computers as Poison Issue, reprinting E.M. Forster's marvelous short story, The Machine Stops. Isn't that? Yeah, I, I, you have to John, that his, I don't know all the You've got to get out more. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, by the way, I just want to note there are all sorts of people in this room who are more than bystanders in this whole revolution. Stuart Brand, in particular, has had 
this amazing pattern of popping up. If you read back through the history of this stuff, he like pops up at every critical juncture in this whole thing, except possibly the 1956 Artificial Intelligence Conference. So, Stuart, do you have a question? So or a comment? Intelligence is a term that's been around, I guess, 70 years now. 56. Yeah. And um, we're working with synthetic biology. And synthetic is a different term than artificial. And I wonder if at some point where all this is going has gone far enough from what they originally thought it was going to do and do Turing tests and things like that, to where it's something else. And they could call it synthetic intelligence or something yeah. else. Than, uh, or but, is, the, is the language need to evolve in some way? Well, the, the field is moving away from, I mean, the Turing test, um, I think, has really turned out to be a test of human gullibility. It says much more about us than it does about the machines. Right. And um, so the field over the last uh, year, sparked by the uh, Emil Guzman incident, where somebody designed uh, uh, some uh, Soviet, uh, uh, Russian, and Ukrainian programmers designed a program that played the part of a 14-year-old boy, and it fooled enough people in, in England that they decided it was a, uh, an intelligent machine. Yeah, but it's easier to simulate a 14-year-old boy than a 14-year-old girl. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> a lot easier. <laughs> Maybe right. But the current thinking is that, you know, just as with humans, we don't have a single intelligent test. We have a series of different tests that test different capabilities of humans. But I, the, the AI field seems to be going in that direction now. There, there are people who argue that we should give the machine standardized tests. One example is giving them an SAT test. Another example is giving them what is called the IKEA assembly challenge. <laughs> uh, which, you know, I... <laughs> so dwell on this, this terminology thing. You're a wordsmith, and Stuart makes a really good point that, I mean, it's quite astonishing that our machines, you know, we've had all the doubling magic of Moore's Law and all these wonders and things, but we're still using the same language that was all invented in the 50s. I mean, the word automation was invented by a Ford executive, and he was just talking about putting cars together, and yet we still use that. AI is from the Cold War, we still use that. IA, we still use that. I kind of like cybernetics because, you know, it's the Greek steersman and all that, but how come we don't have a new vocabulary? Well, there's been attempts. I mean, uh, some I people... like synthetic intelligence. Well, synth I, we I... should note that it happened here tonight. If it catches Stuart on. Brand. <laughs> if it catches on, uh, you know, what, what causes phrases to catch on? People have talked about the idea of artificial general intelligence as being full human level intelligence. And there's still, some, uh, there, there's still a, a, a large number of, of, of technologists who believe that that is that Yeah, is that debate, narrow AI versus artificial AI intelligence. Or artificial uh, yeah. general intelligence. We had a question back here. Yeah, so one comment. Project, so I don't have to repeat. Yeah, one comment, one question. I really like the nuanced approach that you're taking in terms of the robotics. However. I just came out of the conference where they're talking about not our Robotics, but machine learning applied to industrial assets. I was trying to get a sense of what your take is on that, and where we are right now, and whether or not it is wise or dangerous to link some of these. Rephrase yeah. it. Yeah. So um, we're turning these uh, these techniques, pattern recognition techniques, in this case, loose on all kinds of different applications throughout society. And I think one of the best critics of this is an HCI guy whose name is Ben Schneiderman who has written widely about the separation of humans from the machine. And if we delegate these tasks to the machine and we take the humans away from the loop, we uh, basically uh, raise the possibility of, of, base, of, of essentially allowing the machines to work without ethics, which is interesting in the context of the three laws of robotics, which we haven't talked about here, and largely have sort of fallen off the, fallen off the, the you know, the- Yeah, it's the, amazing. The, the, I mean, who's platform. heard the three, as Asimov's three laws of robotics mentioned lately. Yeah, all the, the nerd quadrant over here. But, and oh, right, sorry. <laughs> but I don't I'm, speak I mean, robot. So we're, in, we're, in, we're embedding decision making increasingly into these algorithms and giving them to machines. Look at what happened to Volkswagen. I mean, for God's sakes, this is, I think, a harbinger of what, what's going to come. And so wherever this code is running, you're, you're going to run into those kinds of situations because there, there is human 
intent and decision making embedded in these systems, with perhaps separated from so human control. Let me. I'm going to come to Xander, but you had, you've had your question for a while, so then we'll go to Xander. Uh, practically speaking, how does uh, error rate made by autonomous fast autonomous car compares to general? Oh, driving? that's easy. How, what's the error rate of robotic cars versus human drivers? Well, I think you've got the stats in Google, here. Google has made strong claims. I, I, you know, the problem is it, it, the edge cases are uh, the imponderables. That they, I mean, the error rates in driving on the freeway are probably good enough that right now you would rather have a computer driving than a human already. And, and you know, Elon Musk continues to say that he's going to have self-driving Teslas. I'm not quite sure what he means uh, and how soon your Tesla is going to be able to come from the garage and pick you up and take you home. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hedging because I don't have a, a meaningful answer. But it, it, it depends. It depends on whether it's raining, um, in which case the well, sensors tend to get confused. I would, How do you measure that? Just note that remarkable coincidence in 2007, 20 minutes before the robotic urban grand challenge started, 200 miles to the north in Fresno, there was a 118 vehicle pileup of cars driving through the Thule fog that is there regularly and still people wouldn't slow down. And uh, one of the paramedic fire captains said it was the strangest thing as we were rescuing people from the front, we could hear the car smashing in the pack, back. And I'm reminded of this every time I'm 280, people shouldn't drive. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Google has that information. I don't believe they've made anything public except for their accident rate. So I, you can't really come up with a, the kind of you know, granular information you're, you're asking for. Let's go to Xander here. Um, well, I think, I think you made a very important distinction in this, which is that there's a, in, uh, at least a little bit, which is that there's a big difference between software projects in AI and hardware projects, which you show in the DARPA Grand Challenge very, uh, very well. And we're seeing the kind of exponential, in a sense, at least we're on the we're on the fun part of the software part of the curve. And uh, by the way, we're on the very unfun part of the, well, maybe down in the elbow part of the, the hardware curve. So I think, it's, I mean, it's a bit of a comment from someone who built hardware. I was going to say, his, Xander's, uh, his uh, evenings and weekends, he builds killer robots. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, my take is that you're so, you're so far. Award winning my, killer robots. My hours into building robots is like a thousand hours in for one minute of operation. Um, and in software, it's a little bit different. There's probably many thousands of, hour, of, of, of human hours into it, but you get this kind of exponential growth because you can keep adding onto it, whereas physical things aren't that way. And I think a lot of the problem that we are talking about is the conflation of those two things. Yeah. Well, and also the environments they operate in. In air, space, and cyber, we're going to have autonomous vehicles, no question about it. We, are, we already do. Um, ground, it's a harder problem, which is where you're living in, right? But right. Uh, are yours teleoperated or autonomous? They're, uh, they're teleoperated with some autonomous. With some autonomous, yeah. yeah. How many did you kill this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Just came fast from a race. Um, did the gentleman next to you have a question? No. No, oh, one over. Okay. So we'll do that one question, then I have a final question for you because we're right at the end of our time. Go ahead. No pressure. I just keep coming back to Elon Musk. Uh, but uh, when, when he says, that, uh, on the one hand, that the singularity and the, the robocalypse is something that we should all be thinking about and, and work actively to avoid, on the other hand, he's saying he can have fully autonomous cars in three years. Is that he being audacious or obtuse or? God, uh, Elon amazes me. I've toured SpaceX. And the fact that he can harness the industrial resources he does on the scale that he does. and, and and people tell me he's a terrible manager. How does he do this? I mean, I, so to, to that point, um, I, you know, he, he, he's achieved an extraordinary amount of things. I don't know how he's going to get to self-driving cars in three years. I think he, if he's talking about things like Super Cruise, I mean, he's going to have it next year. GM's going to have it. You know, your machine will be driving itself. But I believe you're going to have to put your hand on the wheel every 10 seconds or it's going to drop out of that mode. Um, so I'm not, you know, it's... it's so you're not going to be able to climb into the back seat. We're going to, I'm going to, moderator's privilege, I'm going to cram two questions into the very end here. Apropos of Elon, so besides Elon, you, you just finished doing this walkabout through the robotic augmentation landscape. 
Who should we watch? Is there one yeah, person well, in particular besides I, Elon? Well, I would watch Google. I mean, I would watch Google. Person. There's a whole, I mean, there were 13 really world-class robotics groups. What about the guy that you couldn't write about in the book? Well, I, no, I, no, no, that's Andy Rubin. Yeah. Uh, Andy, you know, Andy, who is the guy who put together Google's robot division and then left shortly thereafter. I mean, he, start things, he starts things really well. He doesn't run things really well. And I think that's what happened, is that he grew bored after he put the team together and he realized it was like a 15-year-long march to get to where he wanted to go, and he, and he left. But Mark Raybert is remarkable, the guy who, well, we could, we could end on this. Well, no, I have a question to end on, but we'll show the video. This is also highly scripted. The first ballet robot. It got you know, tens of millions of views on the internet. This is before the, uh, the um, so, and the fact that they can design these things is really remarkable. And another, another group of uh, young Japanese designers uh, that came out of the best robot uh, lab in Japan, Shaft, that was also done by so last question. The question is, what, if you had to offer up one surprise that we should be on the watch out for, and I'm going to give you a second to think about this. You've got to really think, and I'm going to give you one. one Carl Chopek, one of the most surprising things I ever heard about robots in 1923. I wasn't there in 1923, but at the very end of Rossum's Universal Robots, there's a scene where the robots are confronting one of the last humans left. And it, it uh, basically says, um, sir, have pity. Terror is coming upon us. We have intensified our labor. Eight million robots have died within the year. Within 20 years, none will be left. Sir, the world is dying out. Human beings knew the secret of life. Tell us their secret. If you do not tell us, we should perish. So for me, the surprise is maybe the robots arrive, and then it turns out they're lonely for humans. <laughs> What's sounds, your surprise? That sounds a lot like Blade Runner. But I, I just um, yes. So um, cloud robotics is the is the potential game changer. People like Ken Goldberg at Berkeley or James Kuffner at Google have this notion that you know you teach one robot, and all robots immediately have that skill that you've taught them. And that kind of a scale up. Or they all pick up this, even you know, all of a sudden, one learns how to smoke, and they're all smoking <laughs> and hanging out on street they, corners. They all go to the beach, because yeah. right, they're self-aware. And that's what you would do if you could make a decision. Let my robots go surfing. Cloud, cloud robotics is really an interesting. The fact that you can leverage one bit of machine learning into all the robots in the world is, is, is really trite. We're right at the end of the time. Let's give John a big hand. Thank you.